Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. I'm excited to bring to you today a service that we've all desperately needed in the past year. I'm going to be talking to Craig Fowler about the streaming service Joy Gauge. So it's the combination of the word joy and engage, I'm assuming. So Help me welcome Craig to the show. Thanks so much, Craig, for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. So I have always, not always, but for a long time, especially during this whole COVID craziness that we've all lived through, really felt that a streaming service was something that we needed for entertainment, education, and anything else related to older adults and caregiving. And obviously you had that idea because you made it happen. Mm -hmm. So do you want to tell us your background or that's probably a good place to start on how you, how you came to, this is probably not something people just generally think up unless they've been caregivers. Well, uh, I'll tell, I'll start with the story of my, of my mother, my mother, Wanda, it's an absolutely wonderful person. Uh, She was, uh, she ended up uh, being diagnosed in the mid 2000s with early onset dementia, likely uh, vascular. They weren't really sure at the time, um, but she had had a number of symptoms and actually retired early uh, in her early 60s, a few years before. And you, we could tell my father and I could tell uh, that there were some things wrong. But I think like many people, we sort of avoided the issue until she had a series of TIAs, uh, which really threw her for a loop. And when we took her in to have that uh, for that, they uh, diagnosed her as having dementia. And then she lived at home with my father for around 10 years after that. And uh, at the very end of her life, just really the last uh, six months, she ended up in going to a memory care unit, uh, to a couple of different ones. But in the 10 years that my father cared for her, I was living an eight hour drive away. So I would fly in all the time. We, I would try to help him. But I kept finding as she got further into dementia that the biggest daily struggle that he had and that she had was really just staying engaged and staying active. So many of the things that my mother Wanda used to do uh, before dementia or even in her early stages of dementia just weren't really accessible to her. She was very involved in church, but so many of her volunteering opportunities became intimidating to her. Uh, She used to love movies, TV, but certain things, but a a number of the things she used to enjoy became confusing to her and she had a hard time keeping up with plots. She liked to do certain types of games early on that uh, word search games, but over at some point in time, those became too challenging for her and frustrating for her. So um, the, the, the thought of joy gauge was to, was, Hey, we know that there are actually quite a few things in the world available that, will fit people of different cognitive abilities, people with different levels of short-term memory, but they're scattered around and not really usually very accessible. So our thought with Joy Gauge is what if we could curate and bring together um, all of those options and kind of use t- technology, modern AI technology to customize those and bring them to individual c- people so that they actually have the ability using the streaming service to access uh, specific types of entertainment, engaging activities that actually fit them where they are uh, without frustrating them, but still provide enough challenge to where they're going to enjoy them. So that's the, the you know, quick background. And what is the, um, what type of entertainment? Is it just solely entertainment at this point? So just cur- streaming? Uh, currently we have uh, entertainment and games. We also have, uh, so we have a, sections for movies, for television, for audiobooks, and a number of audio programs. Uh, we also have a section for the, for memories that allows users or allows our, our members to and their family members to download specific photographs, but put them in a format that's really easily understandable for someone with dementia. That includes putting lots of details about the person, in the photograph, the names, the context. Uh, so we actually have a that also as a as a feature, and we are currently uh, right now adding a feature that is volunteer opportunities. We've had a lot of requests mm. for um, 
uh, for activities that allow people with dementia to um, to help others and to really feel like they're contributing. I know, for example, my mother really helped uh, you know, with someone who was a caregiver herself. She helped lots of people, her mother, her father, and it really made her feel bad that she wasn't able to volunteer and help. So that's a new section that we're adding. Which is definitely really beneficial. I think the longer they can feel useful, the better. My mom got really super combative at the end of her life, like in the Mm -hmm. last year. And one of the things that I struggled with, and I think at this point I was overthinking it, was she always wanted to be a helper. And Mm -hmm. I kept coming up with ideas like, well, if if the care staff would just hand her the stack of napkins, they always had cloth napkins and just have her put them on the tables at dinner time. And if they ended up on the tables, great. And if they didn't, you know, it's not like you can't have two stacks of napkins and they can just disperse them. And I was always really hesitant to bring that up with them because I did not want to add to their responsibilities. I didn't think that would be beneficial. And so I think it would have been a lot smarter to have like had that conversation instead of just like overthinking it in my head, which is what I did. And then she fell and broke her leg and it didn't matter at that point. So but she was always telling the other residents that were in wheelchairs or with walkers, you know, she always like lean out her door and go, if you need any help, just let me know. And it just always cracked me up because I'm like, lady, you need help yourself. Yeah. And so, but that was her mindset. So I think that's a really good idea. So the move, what type of the movies, because I know mm-hmm. my mom started having, she had Alzheimer's for 20 years. So it's hard to remember mm-hmm. at what point things started, you know, when she couldn't track TV shows and commercials, just like I lose track sometimes because you know, you're watching TV at night and you're getting sleepy and you're like, what happened before this, this hideous set of t- commercials, <laughs> which We have a YouTube TV, so we don't generally have to watch commercials, but the movies, I would think that would be a big challenge to, to follow the plot. I have a hard time following the plot on some movies as it is. So are they like specifically curated as, I don't want to say simpler because that doesn't sound right, but I think you know what I'm trying to get at. So we've done a couple of things. First, we've found movies from a number of, and TV from a number of different eras because we're, we're finding, uh, we found that many people with Alzheimer's or different forms of dementia will have time phase back to a certain point in their life where they'll be more comfortable. So we have a lot of different, uh, we have content from different specific eras that we can match to the person. But for movies, what we have been creating, we're actively creating more of these every week, are the what we call uh, recall razors. And we actually refer to them as cheat sheets. So when you pull a movie up, there will actually be an eight and a half by 11 sheet you can print out on your printer or just pull up on your screen, on your computer or your iPad that will give you a, gives a really cool summary that shows in part one, here's what happens in part two from 30 minutes to an hour. Here's what happens in each part and then list the characters on the top with pictures so that anyone who is watching the movie can simply, when they lose track of it and, um, it, this this feature is actually becoming as popular with caregivers as it is for the people who with dementia, but it allows someone to constantly look down and reorient themselves on where they are within a uh, within a movie. Yeah, I could seriously use that because some movies I'm like, who is this character again? I'm like, I'm so confused. I'm done. <laughs> My mm-hmm. husband seems to be able to track those a lot better. I just enjoy like the storylines and mm-hmm. sometimes it. Yeah. You know, sometimes you've got shows or movies where they bounce back and forth between like this was the past and this is the current. And sometimes oh, yeah. they go in the future and it's and there's vis- visual clues as to what they're doing. But sometimes after a while, it's like, what era are we in again? I'm lost. You know, It's just like, I don't know if yeah, that's, that's too complicated in the plot or I'm just not. You know, maybe I need to watch this in the middle of the day when I'm more awake. I don't know. But yeah, I could use a I could use that cheat sheet. That sounds really useful. Well, and and I think, Jennifer, what you just brought up is one of the things that we're learning and we learn we're learning every week as we (laughs) do this process that as we're curating, there are many formats that just aren't very good for people, especially if they have a short term memory loss. I I know I love to watch This Is Us. If you've watched that show on television. But mm-hmm. it constantly goes between different timelines, different 
uh, different eras. And it can be confusing like to, to one of us, someone with dementia, it can be extremely confusing. So we're um, purposefully trying to limit the content that is going to, that we know is going to be extremely hard to follow and disorienting. And unfortunately, some of those kinds of, uh, like you just mentioned, the, the hopping between timelines is becoming a common feature in many newer films. It's something we have to be careful of when we're curating. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now I'm curious as to why that's becoming a thing. But like with This Is yeah. Us, I mean, they are they are basically telling you two different stories at once, but it's they overlap a little bit. But mm -hmm. there are times when it's like, I miss the visual cues and I'm thinking, where am I at? You know, it's like, yeah. fortunately with the DVR type TV, you can back up and go, where are we again? But, you know, it does get old after a while. That's I like the, you know, the simple Chicago Fire, the ones that are like, story from a to b and then it's over and everything is resolved in 45 minutes show <laughs> just yeah, and, simple well and one thing that we're excited about that we're able to that we're we're as a team working on is just getting feedback and watching what works and what doesn't work and getting you know in today's technology you can get data about what individual people if they're watching something all the way through if they enjoy it or not so there's really not been any kind of academic research done in the past on what works well for people with dementia and short-term memory loss. And so um, it's there's a lot of learning that has to be done. There's a lot of anecdotal information as, I, as we talked with, we have our own experiences and talk with others, but you know, until now, no one's really tried to, to summarize that in a, in a, you know, in a data centric way. That makes sense. That sounds like a whole new uh, college degree of mm -hmm. study, which it probably will, if it isn't already a thing, will be a thing since we know that Alzheimer's and dementia just mm -hmm. is increasing exponentially, which is yeah. terrible. But that is an actually interesting field of study. I went to um, San Francisco State. They had a big theater department. So I could, and a big like tech department. Mm -hmm. It's not the right word, but. I can see how those two departments would overlap. And that's really interesting to me <laughs> or the Academy yeah. of art. It's yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting that I'm, I'm seeing that for a long time, it seems the world of academia looked at Alzheimer's disease and dementia as problems to solve versus um, a, something that you need to live with and that you were going to live with, with that we should do research on how people can live better and that is changing. There are some. There's definitely a, a change that's happened in the last uh, last few years uh, that that people are starting to think more broadly about living well with dementia. I know I'm I'm uh, affiliated with the Dementia Action Alliance, and they're a wonderful organization that's really focused on um, people having a vibrant life after their di diagnosis. And but again, there's just that's not been the thinking of academia for many many years, and so it's uh, all the thinking is new. Well, I'm currently reading a book called Running All Over the World, hmm. and it's a gentleman and his life partner. She has early onset Alzheimer's, and they're like marathon runners. Hmm. And so they retired. Well, she had to retire, but he retired somewhat early, and they travel all over the globe, and they run marathons all over the globe. And my first question to him is going to be, how does that not make her confusion worse? Or is it just hmm. that every day is so different, like, and vibrant might not be quite the right word, but it's got some, you know, it's different. So there's like new inputs, like new brain stimulation. I'm really interested in talking to him. It's, he's, he's an upcoming episode. And I, cause I just find it really interesting that, not being in the same place for very many mm -hmm. days doesn't just make her whole her whole disease process process worse. And I'm wondering if he's on to something, not about the running marathons all over the world. I'm not interested in doing that, but just the vibrancy of different. Like I, I don't like I don't I like leftovers. Mm -hmm. I don't reread books. I don't generally rewatch movies or TV shows because I already know what the end is. So that's not very enter entertaining. So I'm wondering if, and I'm, the word that I'm looking for is bouncing around in my head and not coming out, but just the, the uniqueness of every day being a stimulation that yeah. her brain is, is 
latching onto and it's helping her maintain where she's at. Cause that just goes against the grain. And so, I'm, you know, we were talking about living better with dementia. That's what brought that thought to mind is that I think we're going to learn a lot in the next few years, which is going to be kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've learned one of the things since founding this company a little over a year ago, uh, I've been, had a chance to meet so many amazing people and including some amazing people with dementia that really have shattered sort of my uh, my notion of what people who are living well with dementia are and what they do. And I have found a number of people who they travel, they do very different things all the time. And, you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't, I'm not sure if maybe it's, it's, that's something that helps them. If there's just, if individual people like some of us who've traveled for most of our life, if there's a comfort in traveling and doing different activities every day that some people might like and some people won't. But uh, I definitely have seen, been amazed to see so many people who've had dementia for you know, a considerable period of time who are um, quite mobile and are seemingly doing very well with that. Yeah, that's going to be interesting study. My mom was very ambulatory. She spoke in clear, specific words that strung together like a sentence. There was no context that you could grab onto. It was almost like she plucked a sentence out of some other conversation and you were like, wait, I got to catch up. But to somebody that didn't know her, they would usually look at me and go like, what was she saying? I'm like, I don't know. So I'm thinking they're going to learn a lot in the next few years, which I think now that we're talking about, it, it's going to be super fascinating. And I like variety, but I also like home, although mm -hmm. really sick of it after this last year. <laughs> so I'm kind of wondering, like, I don't think I would do well stuck in one place with the same routine over and over. I think that would accelerate a progression of a cognitive disease, which yes. I won't get, but um, I'm just, you know, just kind of like spitballing off the top of my head while we're having this conversation I don't know that the constant travel would be good, but I don't know. That's going to be, we'll see where the husband and I are talking about going on a three week road trip. We'll see how that, <clears throat> how that rolls out and how I feel when we get home. And maybe I'll have well, some anecdotal evidence as to yeah. whether or not I need how much home versus variety I need. Yeah. And I so think for a lot of, for, <clears throat> for a lot of us after the last year, um, who've traveled for a lot of our lives, I know I've spent about almost 25 years on the road all the time for business. And I would have loved to tell if you told me I could stay at home for an entire year, I would have said it would be amazing. But now after a year of being at home, I <laughs> I think a lot of us think very differently. Um, you know, my mother, she was interesting when you mentioned travel in motion. Uh, she, my father, especially as she progressed further in dementia, she, she wanted to go on drives, uh, rides. And my dad didn't like to drive on the highway, so he would drive down country roads in East Tennessee where they were living. Uh, and from, and at some point he was doing this hours a day and she would just, it didn't have to be the same road. It could be different. If you were riding with her, she would, of course, you know, she would recognize every dog she saw and every person at some point. So there was some level of comfort, even though it was different to her, but she loved to be moving and loved to be going somewhere. And that really soothed her. Um, it, all, it, it drove my dad crazy because he was older and spending, I think he did about 20,000 miles on the car the last year that uh, before she went into memory care, not on the highway at all, just driving little country roads. But I also saw from my mom when she moved to assisted living, when she got out of the home into a different area, it didn't go well at all. She was really destabilized. And so I, it was kind of heartbreaking to me to see how tough it was for her to leave a home that she had been in for, I guess at the time, 40, I guess 40, 40 years she'd been in the same house and to, uh, to go somewhere to actually live somewhere else was extremely difficult for her. You said she ended up in two different ones. Why, why did that happen? Cause that sounds like a super nightmare. Oh, it wasn't, it was, it was an absolute nightmare. The first one we put in, she, uh, got kicked out of, of after about a week because she was, uh, had behavior issues as they described them that classic term I hate to use. Um, and they sent her to the hospital to get uh, the proper drugs, which of course don't exist. And after a few weeks, then they said, well, we, they won't take her back because they tried it. Her, and after a day said, no, she can't come back. She has to go to uh, a place that's got a, that specializes in 
difficult case people. And which there were, I think, all of, you know, three in the entire area of a million and a half people or something. So we ended up taking her about an hour and a half away to the Oof. deep hills by the North Carolina border to a, a to a facility that would actually accept her. So it was really tough uh, to take a you know five foot tall, one hundred and ten pound person who you know couldn't has never harmed a fly and probably you know couldn't punch through a piece of styrofoam, but because she was violent. <laughs> Um, she had to be, you know, placed in a special facility that unfortunately for someone like my father was, you know, a long, long drive away. It wasn't easy for him to drive an hour and I guess an hour and 15 minutes each way at his age, mm. just to, to see her. So it was, it was really hard. That he was probably sick of being in the car after all the driving her around. <laughs> yeah. He went from driving her to driving himself. Mm, no, that's not good. It's interesting that they didn't. Like my mom lived, I mean, she was two months shy of three months shy, somewhere in there between two and three months shy of 47 years in the same home, mm. which is where she raised my daughter, my daughter and I, my sister and I, well, my daughter a little bit too. And, you know, everything happened there. And I was just, ugh. the reason we chose memory care was because I had just turned 50. My daughter had just moved out. My sister has school-aged children it was like i and we also assumed that she could easily live 10 or 15 years and there was mm. no way i'm like i'm not mm. giving up the next decade of my life you know if i was 70 yeah. that might be a different ch choice but at 50 no uh-uh i've worked really hard i raised the kid you know it's it's time to time to do the stuff that i want to do and keep working my business so that and i also knew that she would benefit from the activities and stuff, which mm -hmm. she did. And what I didn't suspect is she really benefited from the friendships. That was, yes. that was interesting, but it took her about six weeks to acclimate. She wasn't violent at the beginning. She just, you'd show up and she'd like fall in your arms, sobbing, like, like a hostage being rescued. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget the day I've retold this story a little bit. I showed up for my, my regular visit and she was, following behind another resident who was bound and determined she needed to use that phone. <laughs> oh, those old ladies in the phone for a while were just crazy. And my mom was following her and she saw me and she said, oh, oh, come with me. I have to help my friend. And when she said that word friend, the look on my face probably would have been the same as if they had said, you've just won the jumbo lotto because it was just like <laughs> it was happiness and relief and gratefulness. I was like, oh, thank God. You know, it's like the sobbing and crying and, and wailing are going to be over. And, it, and they were. And I was shocked because after that, she did not acknowledge that she'd ever had this other house. It, I guess it just oh. went into the memory hole and never came back out. It was so that was kind of a benefit. But, you know, they they knew it would take a while. And the executive director told me a month and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, it'll be longer than that. And so he was closer to right than I was. So I'm surprised that this community wasn't a little bit more flexible. But yeah, I, I also, I, I, yeah, well, I, the community my mom was in had kind of a really ugly situation a couple of years ago. They let's see. I knew all the players, basically the a person whose spouse was in my support group and the father of a client of my husband's had an interaction. The the person whose loved one was in my support group, that person was out of town. I'm trying to be real generic here. <laughs> and the person in the memory care got very panicky that they could not get a hold of their spouse and shoved my husband's client's father who fell mm. and broke his hip. And we all know what happens when old uh, people yeah. break hips. <clears throat> so fortunately it was resolved. His wife was in the, is still in the assisted living part of the community and they don't have to pay for her anymore. Cause I mean, it wasn't like it was an avoidable situation, but he'd been a problem in the other community that was down the hill from my house. And part of it was he was very tall. He used to be an ultra marathoner, which is very specific detail. <laughs> it's like I try to tell the story <laughs> yeah. um, as generic as possible, but he was a very active person. And now he's locked in this small area 
And yeah. he, that guy would not, have, I don't know if he's even still alive, but he would not have survived well with the COVID lockdowns at all. And so it's, it kind of goes back to the living well with dementia because in the beginning she would have a, like a running group would run with him, but then it got where they couldn't just run with him and kind of keep an eye on him. It was more of a, a supervisory protection mode that they had to be in. And they were trying to run for the reasons people run. I don't know. I don't run. <laughs> I always say yeah. if the bear's chasing me, I'm lunch. I like the cycle. It's better on your knees, but you know, if there was some way any of the communities in our area could have engaged him physically, that probably would have helped the freak out that happened that caused this unfortunate situation. Yeah, it, it it's tough. I mean, when I when I look back to my mom's situation, and again, one of the things that uh, was inspired me to create Joy Gauge was that when she started getting really bored, she started. You could see that boredom and led to typically a lot of you know acting out and getting angry and which i understand i mean i i you know when my kids were little i think most of us can remember when our kids were there was nothing like a bored kid on an airplane to start doing really bad stuff so if an adult suddenly can enjoy television and other things and they're they're that they used to enjoy and they're enclosed in a small area it, it's natural it's it's not something to do with dementia any of us would get bored and start um, acting out and with dementia, it can, depending on the type of dementia in the person, the acting out could be more severe. And I think what I, I see with the situation that my father and I went to, and I think I've, I've heard this from a number of other people, that sometimes when it gets to be too much for the caregiver at home to deal with, um, the same thing that led to him not being able to uh, keep care of my mom was the same thing that the new place was dealing with. We had thought they would be more capable of dealing with it, but I guess their legal, you know, legal side and others said no. But unfortunately, that left us in a, a situation that I, you know, I, I was told my mother was a special situation. It seems that everyone I talk with seems to have a very similar story <laughs> that their uh, their loved one was also a special situation. So, well, my mom started scratching with because mm. she did not think she needed help, did not want help, got very upset when help was essentially forced on her, which, I mean, mm -hmm. you didn't really have a choice. It's like, you need to shower. We only do this twice a week. Mm -hmm. You've needed to use the toilet. And obviously you're having issues with your clothing because I will never forget one week because we always went out and watched, we went to the park and watched kids. So I was very blessed that she decided to opt out of continuing on with life right at the beginning of the pandemic, because for the most part, in the last 14 months, not been a lot of kids in parks. I don't know what mm, we would have done. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't even know how much they would have let me in, but we wouldn't have been able to do what we normally did that brought her joy. And to me, the little bit of quality of life I was able to give her. But we as we were leaving, she'd always tell me, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. OK, there was thankfully a, a public -ish restroom right as we were leaving one. You know, you always had to open the door and OK, there's the bathroom. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and. She went in one day and said, why am I here? And I'm like, well, you said you wanted to use the bathroom before we went in the car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she literally sat on the toilet sideways, which is not comfortable at all. I tried it when I was by myself. I was like, this is really bad. And just tried to adjust her because, of course, she sat down and then she immediately complained and just adjusting her. Mm -hmm. And I barely touched her. I mostly... I had my hands up so she could see them, but I kind of used my knee to like shift her body over. So she was sitting properly on the toilet. Mm -hmm. It upset her. And then I just backed off and let her do what she needed to do. Literally a week later, I had to help her with her clothes. And I thought, Oh, this is not going to be good. Cause mm -hmm. she doesn't like help. And I'm like pulling her yeah. pants down. And I, the whole time I was like, Oh, she's going to smack me or, you know, thankfully she didn't, but yeah, she, Clawed, drew blood. It was it was embarrassing because they would all say, "Oh, she was so sweet when she first moved in." I'm like, "Well, yeah, I didn't grow up with her, but you know, <clears throat> it was it was hard." And that was one of the reasons I was trying to find ways to give her some purpose so that maybe she wouldn't have you know wouldn't lash out like that as much. But I personally think we need to move away from 
and isolated is not quite the right word, but individually, individual communities to Mm -hmm. a villagey type situation that's incorporated with um, the rest of the community. Like my mom's assisted living facility was across the street from a middle school. So if it had been like, if there had not been like four lanes of traffic between her and the school, you know, if, and this is like, oh, well, let's just blow up an entire town and rebuild it so we can do my my grandiose idea. But if the kids had to like walk through a part of the community to get for, to and from school, then they could interact with the, you know, the adoptive grandparents or something. Obviously, you'd have to keep it secure so the adoptive grandparents didn't get lost. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's mm-hmm. other countries that do stuff similar, not quite as incorporated into the community but i just think we need to and this is probably like you were talking about living better with dementia is if we can incorporate their lives in with the community i think that would help a lot but of course it requires a humongous infrastructure change that isn't easy or cheap yeah but i I think that's a that's a that's a great point and you know one of the things we're trying to do with our volunteering functionality we're giving opportunities for people with dementia to write encouraging letters to kids to um, to um, soldiers overseas. Even we have a section that will allow you to write letters to prisoners and to write letters to people who have dementia who are in, you know, much further along because we've realized that, you know, that it, people who are in earlier stage dementia can actually be very helpful to people in later stages. So we're realizing there's a lot of time and opportunity people have during their day. And if they can even take 20 minutes a day and do something that helps others, First, it's helping others, but second, just the feeling that someone gets, especially if they were one of a naturally a caregiving person, uh, the feeling they get from doing something positive for others can be can just really be a big a big mood changer. And I think that's um, and you know I, I love what you said about kids because one of the things we're getting as we start uh, with Joy Gage is we we get more and more people using our product is feedback of what people want to see. Like I would have never thought. There is a reasonable amount of people with dementia who want to see tractors and farming, but there are a lot of people that grew up and spent their lives on farms, and they actually would like to see something like just you know something that might look boring of a tractor going around. Uh, that's something that can actually be very soothing to someone. And you mentioned kids, watch just watching kids in school, watching kids walking. It's there's a uh, it having as people get further in dementia being isolated from kids is actually really bad and anything that can allow people to in, to interact with kids even just to see kids can be really beneficial i was always surprised probably about the middle my mom was in the memory care for 3 years so about mm-hmm. the middle of her stay there there was a family visiting had a 2 year old and we all know how 2 year olds are and it was mm-hmm. he was a little boy and they would go out in the courtyard because it was a lovely place to sit most of the year because it, it was basically had big overhangs. So you mm-hmm. were in the shade and but you got the benefits of the sunshine. It was lovely. It's like every everybody's courtyard should be designed this way. And of course, he'd go out there and he would chase my mom's obesely fat poodle, which I never understood <laughs> how that dog ran. She literally was double her body weight. And I, I was always surprised when she would take off and run. It was like, whoa, <laughs> fats can run. OK, but, you know, he would chase her and he'd shriek. And I know that used to drive my mother bananas because it makes me crazy. It's like my daughter was not a shrieker. So when little kids shriek, it's like, oh, man, I'm so glad mine wasn't like that. And she just loved it. And I was like, you would have hated that 10 years ago, you know, when you were not your mind was better. And she was so good with him and he was OK with her, too. And you know, when they get to the later stages, they start looking a little bit, you know, I don't want to say scary, but that is kind of like if you're looking at it through a child's eyes. And today I have an episode out on, it's called My Grandma Has Dementia. It's a children's book for, mm. obviously, to help them understand what grandmas might be going through. And I personally think it's an excellent idea to help integrate kids and seniors because- yes. There are so many millennials now that are taking care of parents and grandparents, you know, and if they if you're taking care of your grandparent, you might have not been exposed to older adults much because, you know, your family is not that old. And then, boom, you're taking care of a grandmother or a parent with early onset Alzheimer's. And it's just 
it's kind of traumatizing. So the more we're, it's just, mm-hmm. it's like removing the stigma, becoming yes. socially, you know, like learning how to adapt. We all need to learn how to live better with Alzheimer's, even if we're taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's. I think, hope that makes sense. Uh, abs- <laughs> I know what absolutely. I'm trying to say. <laughs> and And we need to change as a society and not ignore and hide away. I think that's part of it is people don't want to deal with dementia. One of the things I realized when I started a, did a tech startup, I've worked in tech startups for years and I started focusing on dementia. There are, there are a lot of people with dementia and a lot of money spent on care for dementia, but not many people are starting companies or thinking about doing things to help. And I think one of the reasons is young people just don't want to think about it. It's not something that, um, that, that, you know, you, but, but then once people start working with it, they're the people who are working on my team, just they're so passionate because they see the need and the people. But I, um, you reminded me of the story of my mother when, uh, when I would go with Michelle and I would take the kids to, uh, to see my mom, we would always fly down or drive down. And we found one thing that always worked well with my mom and everyone was this drive through animal safari. It probably, not the most humane thing for animals. It was very much a good old redneck style one in the middle of the mountain, nowhere in the mountains, but you'd pay your $10 and drive your car down dirt roads and have a bunch of large animals come and try to eat food from your car. <laughs> and uh, my mom always liked it. It was always a great way to, you know, for her and the kids to spend time. But then as she started getting to, the last time we took her was when she was getting toward, toward the later stages. And suddenly this time she was freaked out. She was scared she was like she was cursing every other words and my kids are sitting in the minivan with her low going mm. but <laughs> anyway and she's like freaking out we're like okay it looks like we're past this point but one of the things that i realized with my kids is how you know observing her over time as she went through with dementia they you know they they just they understood it's almost that they had this natural understanding that it wasn't really who she was that was coming out that there was things she was struggling with and they were just great all the way through. And so I was just really impressed with how, um, even though I probably at the time didn't explain things as well as I could have, I didn't like, didn't have the book <laughs> on it. Um, they just sort of loved their grandmother and understood that, you know, you know yeah, in, in that one trip, she said more curse words in that one trip than she had said in the first like 40 years of my life, 35 years of my life, whatever. It was actually pretty funny. It's funny now. I'm sure you were just like wanting to shove her out the van door at the point. At that point, because <laughs> my mom didn't. Well, the one thing I forgot what it was I said. I said something, and she just looked at me. And she goes, "Oh, that's bullshit." And it's just like, "Okay, fine." And she wasn't a swearer either. And it was just like, "Okay," she was. It was funny, but I find that if they're what's the right word? If they're ah, the word is not wanting to pop out. But if they're the kids are around somebody mm-hmm. like your mom or my mom, like early. Mm, yes. And they, and they, they keep up with the visits and everything. It's just, it's almost normal. I mean, it's not yes. obviously not a normal thing, but it's not scary. It's not, a, it's not upsetting. If you explain why, you know, okay, well, grandma's kind of forgotten her relationship to us. Cause like my mom always thought I was her best friend and it was like, okay, that, oh, that works. You know, <laughs> I never, I suspected that she had forgotten me over time because um, I lost a lot of weight. So I knew I didn't look, I didn't look mm-hmm. like the person she remembered. So it was pretty easy when she stopped remembering who I was. Unlike, I know that's a big struggle for a lot of people, but when you can explain to them, it's just, you know, her mind is mixed up and she knows, she knows we're special, but she doesn't remember that you're the grandkid or that now you're nine mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. They just roll with it a lot better. And I think we'd be better off as a society if we allow kids and older adults to interact so that, you know, one, we have this yeah. intergenerational sharing of memories and and experiences, but we also, you know, there's a lot that they benefit from each other. And Absolutely. I just think we need to do that. And, and the thing that I, Jennifer, I always found my kids struggle with more when they were younger was finding being just dropped in grandma's house where the TV was on playing Andy Griffith wasn't really, they would be bored to tears and, you know, wanting someone's iPad or phone or whatever, you know, I guess early on there was before there was probably an iPad, but they would want something to play with. 
they just weren't, uh, it was sort of like running at two speeds. So I, I do think also finding the right ways to interact and being a little more thoughtful on, Hey, what are things you can do together? Is there the movie that everyone can watch? Is there an event like a, you know, like driving to that park or something? I, I found playgrounds where you mentioned playgrounds, playgrounds were great when the kids were young enough to go. My mother could just watch anybody on the playground and, you know, whether it was, you know, it was her grandkids or not. So part of, I think integrating people from different generations uh, also takes some planning around activities that everyone really enjoys. I can think of like, especially when they're younger, like early, like preschool, kindergarten, that, that young, Mm -hmm. you could do simple puzzles together. My mom and my daughter baked. Mm -hmm. And now let's Mm -hmm. see my, um, okay. My daughter is 29. I'm trying to remember how old my mom was when my daughter was born. I can't do math that quick in my head. And it's like, this is my second Zoom recording today. So Mm -hmm. like, there's, you could tell parts of my brain just want to like take a break. But it would have been nice if my daughter could have done things like, like flip the script instead of Mm. my mom teaching her baking, my daughter baking with her grandmother being an assistant. Because that would have been fine in the earlier to mid stages, you know, and my mom was very creative and crafty. She sewed, she painted, she did woodworking. Mm -hmm. So if and I tried really hard to find those activities like to a simplified version of those activities, Mm -hmm. but I think we started way too late. And so engagement is really important throughout. It's like she stopped going to the woodworking classes. And I remember there was an excuse and I don't remember exactly what it was, but I knew at the time I'm like, I think this is BS. I think you're having a hard time following along. And obviously I was kind of a little bit relieved that she stopped using big power tools. because It's like, (laughs) you know, it doesn't yeah. take too much of a slip of the attention. And then, you know, you might have nine fingers instead of 10. And if your brain isn't quite, you know, working the way it's supposed to, it makes those kind of accidents even more easier to happen. Wow. That didn't even sound like a grammatically correct sentence, <laughs> but I think it was, I think she was in denial. My dad let her be in denial and it, made it really easy to just stop doing things instead of trying to find ways of like what you're doing is find different ways to do something similar. Yes. And we're in a world that is designed for people with good attention spans and excellent short-term memory. If you look at most activities, most classes, most things that you do today, um, you know, you, it's designed for that. You know, I've, joke before that I, I, I use, I've used Hulu for years, but if you go to the Hulu, Hulu live, I think they have a extraordinarily complex user interface. If you actually try to go and find a show, it's, it's maddening for me. I couldn't imagine someone like my mom at the time ever being able to figure out how to you know, go through that. And it's not. So I think often what I see today is we have technologies. So in some ways like zoom and uh, people doing a video on Facebook Messenger, they're really simple and easy for people. At the same time, we're, you know, some companies are going the other way and saying, hey, we want to add all these cool new tech features and and they're designing for a 23-year-old with great short-term memory. And it can be intimidating for people like your mother or my mother and for the many people with dementia today. And the standard response I usually see is let's just, we're embarrassed, we can't keep up, let's just avoid the activity. But that leads to boredom and and the lack of engagement. Well, these tech companies need to realize that the globe, but America in particular is graying. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, we're getting older. There's less, you know, there's the boomer generation and then you and I are Gen X Mm -hmm. and then there's more millennials than there are of us. And I don't know what the Gen Z, how many, I think there's probably less of them than millennials, but it's like, there's less young people than there are old people. So hello, (laughs) let's, focus on the uh, market that's biggest, right? So yeah. that's what I learned in business school. <laughs> yeah, a- absolutely. And, you know, even if someone, you know, the, our, our generation and even a lot of boomers are very, getting very tech savvy, but there's a difference between being tech savvy and, and that, you know, being and not and having being completely free of any kind of cognitive impairment. And as we age, certain types of cognitive impairment are just become likely by the time someone's 90, there's a very solid chance they have some type of cognitive impairment. 
And that is, you know, again, not how technology companies are designing the world. So I think we, um, I, I've been, I, I often laugh at some of the products I've seen for older people that seem to be just so simplistic that they're almost funny. But so I don't think you have to go to the extreme of, you know, having, <laughs> uh, you know, ha having a screen with two buttons on it. Um, but I do believe we have to be th much more thoughtful about user interfaces. And that's something we're trying to do with joy gauges to experiment and, and find ways to make it, um, you know, to, to, to give people variety so that they can find what they want, but not make it like a Hulu or Netflix or something where you have a billion choices that you have to navigate that at some point will just frustrate someone without, with, 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 a sh that struggles with short-term memory. I find with the streaming, I think was it Discovery Plus? My husband just recently signed us up for so that we he can watch the Tour de France, and we have priorities, obviously. And it sometimes it's like, really, didn't it's like, can you just show me the shows that I have? You know, like we like, yeah, um, hometown. Can you just show me the episodes we haven't seen, like the latest one because we've seen all the past ones. And sometimes I find it you could spend twenty or thirty minutes scrolling through stuff to look find something to watch and then by then it's like i'm so bored i'm gonna go read a book <laughs> yeah and and it drives me crazy when services start playing audio previews the second that you come on that just drives me nuts like i don't want to hear and in some services they they want to market the their own movies and things that they created they want you know they're they're there's often a reason you're seeing certain things at the top of your list on Spotify or, you know, or Netflix or others. And, and that may or might, may not be only that you're, that it's something that's great for you. It can be that it's something that's also profitable for, for the company. And again, with joy gates, that's something we want to be kind of wary of. We want to try to have a service that understands the person and uses, you know, some pretty sophisticated algorithms and machine learning to understand the person, but that it's kind of agnostic to what it is. If it's something that's going to work well for the person, we want that to be the top thing on the list, right? We don't care about where it's coming from. If it's anything to do with us or someone else, we just want to match people to things that will make them happy. Makes sense. I love messing with algorithms. Like my podcast subscription list is completely schizophrenic. I have like <laughs> news, politics, True crime and crafting podcasts of all things. I listen to those while I'm doing my little hobby. And so it has absolutely no clue what it is I like. <laughs> Not really. I mean, it it's probably figuring it out by now, but then I'll throw in something different. Just I don't know, because it, it I like variety. And so it throws off the algorithm. So I I laugh because I understand it just enough that I realize that it's challenging. And we've been watching um that my particular hobby has weekly demos on YouTube, their YouTube lives. And now my husband's getting push notifications about these, this, a similar service or similar oh, yeah. products. And he's like, this is crazy. It's like, this is your hobby, but he likes to watch them too. It's just like, yeah, it'll I, be I, interesting. Yeah. It seems, it seems to be really, you know, strange. This house is the same way where someone's searching and suddenly I'm getting a bunch of things that teen girls would like up on my phone. I'm like, uh, where did this come from? I've never searched. I'm like, Oh, we're on the same. Oh, we're on the same exact server. And it's, yeah, yeah it's, uh, I mean, there, there, the promise of algorithms is there. It's just, um, well, we could talk for a whole show on just uh, how poorly they're often executed and, and the weird things that we see when they are executed poorly. Probably easier to execute them poorly than to dig deeper. Like it sounds like you're doing. So where can people find this wonderful service that's better than Netflix? Great. <laughs> well, just if you just go to www.joygage.com, that's J-O-Y-G-A-G-E. Uh, that's a place there's an ability to try it out for free. Uh, you can just go straight on and start using it. We've designed it, adjusted recently, where now it will work on any device, any computer, any phone. You don't need to, you can download an app, but you don't necessarily even need to download an app. You can just start using it. Um, our goal was to make this accessible to almost everybody. So we wanted to make it um, not something that's, you know, you pay a huge amount for, for but just a simple subscription service that's low cost that can be accessed by anybody. So yeah, go to 
Uh, and also with Joy Gage, you can go to our Facebook page. There's more information, but uh, the easiest way is just go straight to our website. Awesome. Well, that's going to be hot linked in the show notes. And then a quick question. Does it work on internet connected TVs yet? Or is that coming or uh, not? you can, you can, you can use it from the browser, anything that's got a browser, you can use it from. So as long as you're in it, my internet connected TV has a browser. Um, we haven't, uh, you also can uh, cast it from your phone or device. So it casts onto TVs. So Mostly, I know my smart TVs, I can I either have a Chromecast or you can cast it straight in, so it should work that way. We, not to be too nerdy, but we've decided we aren't really building like LG and Samsung and Sony apps and whatever, only because we're so small. And it just, it, it, it's, it would be, instead of going that route, we just said, hey, let's make sure that we have versions that work, work on any browser. That way we, we can kind of hit everybody and make sure that hopefully 95% of the people can get it to work, cast to their TV versus, uh, downloaded to their TV. Well, no, we have an Android TV in a house full of Apple products and we can, we can do airplay to our TV. I don't know if it has a browser. I'll have to look. Haven't, I haven't had that need. The husband would know. Mm. And he came in here to say hello and realized that I was recording. So for anybody Mm. that's watching the video, that's what, that's what that weird interaction a few minutes ago was because he didn't realize (laughs) So we're using actually a Google YouTube API for most of the videos and stuff. So it that will cast almost any TV, at least so far. So chances are, um, if it's a smart TV, it will probably be able to cast from us. And if it doesn't work, just let us know. We, we're we always fi- wanting to find the corner cases we didn't plan for. Which those I'm sure pop up. Well, this is fantastic. Yes. Do you have a, what's, what's, you're, you're only about a little over a year old, right? So mm-hmm. what's. What's on the horizon for where you're going, like short uh, term? So the short term, as I mentioned, we're adding the volunteer section in. And what we've had, a what we um, we are creating more as we get more people using our products. We're calling everyone a member. Um, we're going to create more also social communities. That's what we've got a lot of demand for this year as we get more people with dementia as being able to link them together so that they can interact with each other, perhaps video sessions, others, but we're realizing that once you get a number of people who are all like-minded, who are in similar situations, that um, it, it allows us. So what I think you'll see within the next six to 12 months is are a lot more opportunities for people to be social, but social in a safe area with people who understand, all of whom under either have dementia or understand dementia very well, so that they're not going to be judged from uh, for, for acting or typing or saying things in a certain way. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Well, yeah. I am excited about this. It's definitely something that we've needed. I'm sure people wish that you'd thought of this a little bit sooner after last year, <laughs> but that probably helped included. you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm sure. Well, you know, better late than never. Yes. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing all of the I don't want to say improvements, but all the additions, yes. all the exciting things that you guys will be doing. And I Thank hope you, that sir. a lot of the listeners will tune in and check it out because I'm definitely sure it will be a benefit to all of the family caregivers who have their loved one at home. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. And thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.